In this lesson, we're going to be discussing the definitions of the different special quadrilaterals. Over the next couple of classes, you'll be investigating properties of different special quadrilaterals, and this lesson is just going to give you a sense of how they're all defined. So as a refresher, a quadrilateral is simply just a polygon that has four sides. And one thing you may have discussed is that prefix quad that's part of the word refers to four. The first type of special quadrilateral we'll look at is called the parallelogram. Now you may have already spent some time in class looking at the parallelogram and its properties, so this should just be a quick review. So how a parallelogram is defined is almost part of the word. You'll see the word parallel as part of it. And a parallelogram is simply just a quadrilateral, which I'll abbreviate quad, so it's a quad with both pairs of opposite sides parallel. So let's mark up what that would mean for the quadrilateral here. So again, both pairs of opposite sides would be parallel. So this side here would be parallel to the opposite side here. So we'll use little single arrows for that. And then this side up here would be parallel to this side here. So again, we'll use double arrows to indicate that. So that's all a parallelogram is, a quadrilateral where both pairs of opposite sides are parallel. The next type of special quadrilateral we have is the rectangle. And as you probably know, a rectangle is just a quadrilateral with four right or 90 degree angles. So to mark that for the quadrilateral here, we just have to put in four 90 degree angle markings, so the little right angle corner marks here. Now another vocabulary word you might remember from studying polygons is equiangular, and a rectangle is an equiangular quadrilateral. So again, equiangular means every angle and this polygon would be congruent, and it's certainly equiangular because it has four congruent 90 degree angles. And another thing to notice is a rectangle is considered to be a type of parallelogram. It's a more specific than just a, any old parallelogram, but it is still considered to be a type of parallelogram. Our next special quadrilateral is the rhombus, and a rhombus is a quadrilateral with four congruent sides. So I'll use the congruent symbol to abbreviate there. So that's pretty simple to mark for this quadrilateral here. We just have to put the same tick mark in all four sides to indicate that they're all congruent. So we'll put a single tick in all four sides. That would indicate that this quadrilateral is a rhombus. So another vocab word you might remember from studying polygons is equilateral. And a rhombus is considered to be an equilateral quadrilateral. And of course, it's equilateral because it has four congruent sides in this case. And just like the rectangle, a rhombus is also a type of parallelogram, a more specific than just any old parallelogram because it has the four congruent sides. But it's still considered to be a type of parallelogram. Next, we have the square, which is a quadrilateral with four right angles and four congruent sides. And again, I'll use the congruent symbol to abbreviate that. So to show this quadrilateral is a square, we just have to put in four right angle markings like this, and also use the same tick in all four sides to show that all four sides are congruent. So those markings would show that this quadrilateral is a square. So some vocabulary that's important here is that a square is both equilateral, because it has the four congruent sides, and equiangular, because it has the four congruent right angles. And as you probably remember from studying polygons, if a polygon is both equiangular and equilateral, then it's considered to be a regular polygon. 
So a square is a regular polygon or a regular quadrilateral. Now a square is also considered to be a rhombus because it fits the definition of a rhombus. It happens to have the additional characteristic of having the four right angles that not every rhombus would have, but a square is considered to be a rhombus as well. And in a similar way, a square is also considered to be a rectangle because it fits the definition of a rectangle. It's a quadrilateral that has four right angles and has the additional characteristic of the four congruent sides, but it fits that definition of a rectangle. And just like a rhombus and a rectangle, it's also a type of parallelogram. So again, it's almost like if you combined the characteristics of a rhombus and a rectangle, that would make what a square is. Next we have a trapezoid, which is a quadrilateral with exactly one pair of opposite sides parallel. So let's mark that for the quadrilateral here. So we'll indicate that this side here is parallel to this side here, with those little parallel arrows. So unlike a parallelogram that has two pairs of opposite sides that are parallel, a trapezoid only has that exactly one pair of opposite sides that's parallel. Now there's also some vocabulary that goes with the sides of a trapezoid. The parallel sides of a trapezoid are called the bases. So these two sides would be referred to as the bases of a trapezoid. And the non-parallel sides are called the legs of the trapezoid. So again, the bases are the parallel sides, so we'll use the parallel symbol to abbreviate that. And the legs of a trapezoid are the non-parallel sides. So just some important vocabulary to know for trapezoids. Now a more specific type of trapezoid is the isosceles trapezoid. And an isosceles trapezoid is a trapezoid, which I'll call a trap, with congruent legs. So as you recall, the legs are the non-parallel sides of a trapezoid. So to show that for the uh, quadrilateral here, we'll indicate it's a trapezoid by marking that this side is parallel to the opposite side. And to show this is an isosceles trapezoid, we'll mark that the non-parallel sides where the legs are congruent. So we'll put a tick mark here and here to show that this is an isosceles trapezoid. So again, if a trapezoid has congruent legs, then it's called, considered to be an isosceles trapezoid. Our last type of special quadrilateral is a kite. So before defining it, I'm actually going to mark how a kite would work in terms of its congruent sides first. So the way it works is there's two adjacent pairs of congruent sides that meet at opposite vertices. So I'm going to focus on this vertex up here and mark that the sides that are adjacent to it are congruent. So mark that that pair of sides is congruent. Then I'm going to go to the opposite vertex down here and mark that the adjacent sides to that vertex are also congruent, with kind of two tick marks this time. And that's kind of how a kite is defined. It's got two adjacent pairs of congruent sides. So again, it's a quadrilateral with two, I'm going to say disjoint, which I'll clarify in a minute, pairs of adjacent congruent sides. So the word disjoint just means you can't have a side overlapping in each set. So let me draw an example of a quadrilateral that would not fit the definition of a kite. If I had a case like this where I had a pair of adjacent congruent sides meeting at this vertex, and also a pair of adjacent congruent sides meeting at this vertex, those are not disjoint because they kind of have this side in common here. So this would not be considered a kite in this case. So again, I think the thing to wrap your mind around is they have to meet at opposite vertices. This vertex here and this vertex here are opposite to each other, whereas the congruent sides here don't really meet at opposite vertices. You get this vertex that's adjacent to this one. Now there's also some vocabulary to know for the different vertices of a kite. So the vertices where the adjacent congruent sides meet, which would be this vertex and this vertex here, are called the tip and the tail. So I'll indicate that in the diagram here. And again, the tip and tail of a kite are the vertices where the adjacent congruent sides meet.
and the tip and tail will always be opposite each other as well. Now, I never had names for the other two vertices until a couple of years ago when a student said, why not just call them wings, kind of like an actual kite has wings. So I'm going to say, we'll call this vertex a wing and this vertex a wing. I kind of like that name for them. So again, the wings of a kite would be the other two vertices. As a way to summarize all the vocabulary that's in this lesson, we're going to make a quadrilateral family tree and show us how all these different definitions fit together. So at the top, we'll just put that we have quadrilaterals, which again are just polygons that have four sides. And we're going to make a branch way over here for just arbitrary quadrilaterals, which are quadrilaterals that don't have any necessarily special characteristic to them, just some polygon that's got four sides, but isn't one of the types that we talked about in this lesson. Now the next branch we'll make are the parallelograms. So again, a parallelogram is a quadrilateral that has the two pairs of opposite sides that are parallel. And there's also more specific types of parallelograms we talked about. So below parallelogram, let's put one branch for a rectangle. So again, that has the four right angles. And one branch for a rhombus, which has the four congruent sides. And both of those are considered to be a type of parallelogram, which is why they belong in this branch. And then below rectangle and rhombus, we'll put that there's a square. And again, a square is both a rectangle and a rhombus, because a square has the four right angles that a rectangle does, and the four congruent sides that a rhombus does. Now our next branch we'll put is the kite. So again, that has the two adjacent pairs of congruent sides. And in certain books, a rhombus is actually considered to be a type of kite. So I'll draw a little dashed line here, depending on what textbook you use a rhombus might be considered to be a type of kite. And then over here I'll put a branch for trapezoids. So again, that's a separate branch because these have exactly one pair of parallel sides. And below trapezoids there's the isosceles trapezoid, which are the trapezoids that have congruent legs. So again, this is just a visual that shows all these different definitions fit together. And as you study the properties of all these shapes, you'll see how these, these all fit together and connect with each other. As a last example, we're going to take a look at applying one of the definitions we've talked about to a more algebraic problem. So here we're told that ABCD is a kite, and its tip is A, and its tail is C. So if we mark up what that means, they've told us that one pair of congruent sides will meet at A, and the other pair of congruent sides will meet at C. So we'll indicate that with tick marks. DA and BA would be congruent, and BC and DC would be congruent. Now we're also given some expressions for the side length, so we'll put those in. DC is x squared minus 6x, so we'll mark that here. BC is 16, we'll mark that here. And then AD is 5 minus x. And we're asked to determine the perimeter of ABCD. Well, in order to find the perimeter, I think we're going to have to know what the value of x is first. So we'll have to look for an equation that will help us solve for x in this diagram. Now using the definition of a kite and the way we've marked the diagram, we would know that CD is congruent to CB, which is going to help us make our equation. We would know that x squared minus 6x will have to equal 16. Those two lengths would have to be the same. So we have a quadratic equation here, which means we're going to make the equation equal to 0, and most likely we solve this by factoring. So we'll start by subtracting 16 from both sides. We'll have x squared minus 6x minus 16 equals 0, and then we'll break this up into two factors. So let's see, if we have x squared, I know I can use x and x, because x times x would make x squared. And let's see, we need a combination that's going to multiply to negative 16 and also combine back to that middle term of minus 6x. So I'm thinking that negative 8 and positive 2 will do that. Negative 8 times 2 would be negative 16, and if we multiplied these factors back out, we would get that middle term of minus 6x. Okay, so to solve this, we'll use the zero product property, which means either that first factor is zero, x minus eight is zero, or that second factor has to be zero, x plus two is zero. So let's see, if we add eight to both sides here, we get x equals eight, and if we subtract two from both sides here, x would be negative two. Okay, now we have to decide if both of these values of x will work, or if one works and one doesn't for this diagram. So let's look at the expression here, five minus x. If x is 8, and we substitute into that expression, we'd have that AD would be 5 minus 8, or 
AD would be negative 3, and that doesn't make sense for a length. So that means that we can reject that solution of x equals 8. We know that side lengths in this class cannot be negative. Now, if x is negative 2, let's figure out what the length of AD would be in that case. AD would be 5 minus negative 2, which we know would be 5 plus 2, which means the length of AD in that case would be 7. Um, that's certainly a reasonable measurement we could have for that side. So even though it's not our final answer, I will indicate that we're taking the value of x equals negative 2 as the value of x we're using here. And we've just found that AD is 7, so we'll put 7 here. Now let's see, we want the perimeter, so we need the measurements for all four sides. Well, AB is congruent to AD, so I know AB is also going to be 7. And if we were feeling a little bit lazy, we could say that the measurement for CD has to be 16. Um, however, I am going to find the value of that expression, x squared minus 6x using negative 2 for x, just because it's a nice built-in check. If I find what CD's measurement would be when we substitute in negative 2, it should end up being 16. That's a nice built-in check. So CD will be negative 2, that quantity squared, minus 6 times negative 2. So let's see, for that we'd have negative 2 times negative 2 would be 4 when we square that. And let's see, we have 4 plus 12, and then CD would actually be 16. That's good news. So again, we definitely knew that should have been 16. That's a nice built-in check. All right, great. Now to find the perimeter, we're just going to add up the lengths of all four sides here. So let's see, 16 and 7 would make 23. Let's add 7 onto that, and we'd get 30. And add another 16 onto that, the perimeter would be 46 in the end. So our perimeter here would be 46 units. Okay, so a pretty typical problem. Um, one thing to be aware of, though, is that the negative x value actually worked in this case. Don't always assume the negative x value is the one that you're going to automatically reject. You have to look at the measurements in the diagram when you're deciding which value of x works. Here, that expression, 5 minus x, actually was negative when we substituted x equals 8, but it was something reasonable when we substituted negative 2. So again, something to be aware of. So here's a practice question that's very similar to the one we just went through. Um, in this case, you're going to be using the definition of a square to set up an equation and to determine the perimeter of a square. So again, remember that you must attempt this practice question to get full credit on your notes.